Okay, so I think um, people will still be joining, but we will get going right now. So we're going to start off with a question for you all. And this is, which area of infectious disease research should be prioritized above other areas and why? And I want you to consider this during the meeting. So my name is Josie Golding and I'm from the Wellcome Trust. And this webinar is being hosted in partnership with the Global Health Network. Today, I want to talk to you about seeking advice. This is important because how we do this can affect where Wellcome works and what is funded. We want to do things in a different way when it comes to engaging and listening, and we want to get it right. We all share a common goal to ensure that we reduce the impact of infectious diseases, but we recognize that there are no easy, quick solutions to this. It will require a long-term approach and a broad community to work together effectively. Over the next hour or so, we will hope you will come to believe, as I do, that this is an exciting opportunity for Welcome and for others like Welcome to act in how we listen and work with others. But also the opportunities in which you can work with Welcome in the future. Today, we'll be talking about what methodology we followed to hear your perspectives, what the findings were, and finally, what difference this will make to Welcome and to others. We want you to reflect on, on what's being discussed and note down your questions in the Q&A function, which we will discuss later. But ultimately, we want you to get in touch, to apply for welcome funding and to work with us to find solutions to combat the problem of infectious diseases. I'm now gonna hand over to Trudy Lang at the Global Health Network, who's gonna run through some of the housekeeping and the agenda for this meeting. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, I really won't keep you um, very long uh, now at all. We'll hand straight into the meeting. Just to say we have interpretation set up for you today. So have a look on the bottom of your screen and you can see um, how you need to um, activate that and choose the language you'd like that to be presented in. So do go ahead with that now. And then um, we're recording this session and it will be available later for people to watch. Do use the chat function to introduce yourselves. It's great to see so many people on. And then really importantly, we have an open session later today and we really want to hear from you. So use the Q&A function to post your questions and comments and we'll try and get through as many as we can um, when we come back to that session. And so I think we're ready to go back um, to take you through the session. You're gonna hear from some of the scientists we've worked with and we're gonna run through the whole um, study that happened and have lots of time to really think about the interpretation and what's going to happen next. So back to the welcome team to really take us through why we did this work together. Thank you. Over back to you, Josie. Thank you, Trudy. So uh, next slide. So before describing the aims of the study that are going to be highlighted today, I wanted to provide a short overview of welcome and our interest in funding and supporting researchers, uh, recognizing that not everybody's coming to this webinar with the same information. So to begin, we are a global charitable foundation that is financially and politically independent. We have offices in London and Berlin, and we work with partners around the world to help solve the most pressing health challenges facing humanity. We believe that by fueling great ideas that address open questions about life, health and well-being, we can discover new knowledge with the potential to transform health in the future. We primarily do this through our discovery research platform, which has three open mode schemes that are run throughout the year and target to different career stages. In addition, we do this alongside focusing on urgent health challenge areas where our experience and expertise and influence can drive rapid change and we can have an impact in the short term. These are the areas of greatest priority for welcome include mental health, climate and health and infectious diseases. Next slide, please. So our goal in the infectious disease strategic program differ more from the open nature of discovery research platform. Here, we're really targeting problems that exist to support science to overcome these biggest barriers to control infectious diseases in the most affected communities. 
We are working where we can have the most impact to prevent and treat infectious diseases and where the need is greatest. We recognize that often to design and implement interventions in whatever shape and form, it does require a good understanding of how infectious diseases emerge or at risk of escalating um, our current control strategies. So we use our funding, influence, engagement, and our partnerships to be able to achieve these goals. Next slide, please. This approach today, though, does feed into a wider welcome diversity and inclusion strategy, which includes how we become a more inclusive funder and have a broader reach and to ensure a more equal health outcomes in the research that we fund. This study marks one of the many approaches we are taking and trialing at Welcome to better understand how to approach this. Next slide, please. So I want to just highlight some of my two colleagues who are going to be on this call, and you'll hear from them later, who have really led this project from Welcome side in partnership with the Global Health Network. So Dr. Petra Fay and Dr. Anna Chichoven, you'll hear more about them um, in the webinar talking about the implications of this research. Next slide, please. So the primary focus of this project really was to broaden um, um, who we hear from in the global research community, working on research specifically around reservoirs emergence and transmission of escalating infectious diseases. We wanted to understand the perceptions of research priorities, as well as the barriers and the enablers to achieve them. We wanted to develop and strengthen relationships with global stakeholders across a range of research fields, particularly those that are based in disease endemic countries. And we wanted to bring this together to increase Welcome's knowledge of the broader field and consider how we continually improve how we approach research funding practice. Next slide. At the start of the project, Welcome convened a diverse expert committee to advise us on the study and support its implementation. We have been very fortunate to have such an engaged group, and I would like to take this moment to thank them all, including their fantastic critical feedback that's been required, which has ultimately shaped our discussions throughout, and in particular, um, during the workshops held. So I just want to take a moment to thank you. And next slide. I'll continue talking, but to end, I want to thank you all for you for being here today, whether you're on this journey from us at the start by completing the online survey or your attendance at the regional workshops, or whether this is your first time engaging. We appreciate the varying starting points people are coming from today. Therefore, I hope in the next set of discussions, this will help bring the study to life and inspire you to ask questions via the Q&A function but most importantly, to stay engaged with Welcome and apply for those funding opportunities in the future. I'm going to now hand over to Ryan Walker from the Global Health Network, who will set out how we approach this study. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you to Josie for that fantastic introduction. I just want to say it's really exciting to be on this meeting today and to be able to share some of the findings we've had from this really, I think, innovative and novel study that we've conducted over the past year. So my name is Dr. Ryan Walker. I am a research and project manager at the Global Health Network, and I've been the research manager from the Global Health Network side on this project throughout its duration. Uh, next slide, please, Louis. So as Josie has alluded to in her previous comment, the aim of this study was, was to ask a broad, broad global community about these three key research questions. First, what infectious diseases do people think present the highest risk of escalation in their particular settings? Then once we've identified those diseases, what types of research are necessary to mitigate those escalating infection threats? And then finally, what are the barriers, but not only what are the barriers, what are the enablers and what are the opportunities presented by some of these research gaps as well? And the way we go about this is uh, harnessing a method that the Global Health Network has uh, developed and validated uh, over the entire life cycle of the Global Health Network so far, which was so far to link crowd consensus. And uh, the reason that we uh, we realized that there was such a valuable opportunity to apply this methodology here with this project is it aligns very, very closely with the comments that Josie was making earlier on capturing advice and perspectives on health, on new ways on capturing advice and perspectives on uh, health research and health research opportunities. And this method works really well for four key reasons. One, it's democratic. So via the Global Health Network's community of practice approach, it involves individuals from across the entire research spectrum. 
And also, critically, we reach groups that are normally excluded from these sorts of priority setting activities. Uh, it's also very agile, and you can see examples on the slide here of the numerous different settings and partners and scientific disciplines that we've uh, managed to apply this method in. So in setting a research skills training curriculum, in identifying research priorities for COVID, in identifying pharmacovigilance and medicine safety priorities, and now with identifying infectious disease priorities in this project with Welcome. Uh, most importantly, it's very robust. So this entire methodology is underpinned by outcomes by uh, well-established and frequently used methodologies and processes in global health research. So that includes community of practice theory and action research. But perhaps most importantly, this is an iterative process. And that means that the outcomes and approaches at subsequent uh, stages of this project are informed by the previous activities. And hence, all of these project outcomes are informed and driven by the participants. And what this looks like in this project, was first of all, we conducted a survey. So we designed and disseminated this, and this was to answer those three key questions that we uh, showed on the previous slide in a very broad manner. Next, uh, after analyzing the findings of the survey, we decided to hold three uh, regional workshops across the global south. So we held a workshop in uh, the Asia Pacific region in New Delhi. We held a workshop in Africa in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and we held a workshop in the Latin America and Caribbean region in uh, Brazil, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And this workshop was shaped by the findings of the survey. So we decided to share the findings of the survey for feedback from the workshop participants. And then we convened these workshops and saw participants comments on the particular disease findings, the particular types of research that, that were identified, the particular barriers and enablers to research as well. And ultimately, we cre uh, collated all of these findings and ideas in a single report to uh, answer that key question of what are these particular research priorities in this setting. Next slide, please, Lily. Uh, what I'm going to give here is just a quick overview of the demographics of the participants that we had in this study. This particular slide focuses on the demographics of the survey participants. Uh, so you can see, for example, that we had almost 4,000 uh, respondents to this particular survey. So an enormous breadth of skills, knowledge, and experience were put into answering these three questions. And there was an enormous body of perspective gathered there as well. Uh, we had responses from over 151 countries and territories, the vast majority of which you can see uh, almost 90% were from lower middle income countries. And you can see a couple of examples of the, the highest uh, participating countries on the left-hand side there. So Kenya, Brazil, Honduras, Uganda, Nigeria, Malawi, really great representation across the global south. Uh, you can see on the right hand side some of the breakdown of the, the uh, participants per study region, so a large number of participants from Africa, but also good representation from Latin America and the global north and the Asia Pacific as well. And again, this is just an example in the bottom right corner to evidence the amazing range of skills, expertise and knowledge that has contributed to the findings of this study. So you can see this is just the top 10 job roles that were represented across the survey participants. In total, there are at least 63 different uh, backgrounds and, and ranges of experience represented. But you can see, whilst a strong representation from academics in the middle, you also collectively see good representation from healthcare professionals as well. So on this slide, we can see doctors, we can see nurses, we can see community health workers. We have good representation from people in the laboratory community and, for example, in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries, with scientists, laboratory professionals, and also people working in civil society as well. So civil servants, we have politicians, so a really broad range of experiences and insights contributing to this body of knowledge. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Salvia Zishan, and I will be sharing findings on the disease priorities from this study today. The survey of the priority setting exercise included the question asking responders about diseases they felt posed the greatest infection threat and why. This was an open-ended and free text question. When the responses for the question were analyzed and segregated by region, Malaria ranked highest as the perceived infection threat among participants in Africa, fourth in Latin America and Caribbean, fourth in Asia Pacific, and sixth in the Global North. HIV AIDS did not rank in the top 10 in the Global North participants, but ranked second in Africa, third in Latin America and Caribbean, and sixth in Asia Pacific. 
tuberculosis was found to be the greatest perceived threat in Asia Pacific, followed by ranking second in Latin America and Caribbean and third in Africa. Dengue, which emerged as the highest infection threat in Latin America and Caribbean, was ranked second in Asia Pacific and did not appear in the top 10 in Africa. It was ranked 15th in Africa. Cholera was listed at fourth in perceived infection threats by participants in Africa, but did not appear in the top 10 priorities in Latin America and Caribbean or Asia Pacific. It is important to note that this is how the respondents answered the question in the survey, and there were no response options or a list to choose from included for this question. The differences in responses on disease priorities among participants from high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries were seen, and they are highlighted here. Participants from high-income countries responding to the survey perceived antimicrobial resistance or AMR as the biggest threat, while AMR ranked seventh overall in the low- and middle-income countries. Influenza ranked second among participants from high-income countries and did not feature in the top 10 disease priorities in the low- and middle-income countries. Both malaria and HIV AIDS appeared high in the perceived infection threats by participants in the low and middle income countries, and they were not seen in the top 10 infection threats by participants in the high income countries. Qualitative insights were drawn from participant responses to the survey, providing a rich understanding of their experiences and perspectives, and serving as an important component to the analysis. A clinical officer from Malawi shared how COVID-19 pandemic has disturbed health services for other diseases and decreased access to humanitarian aid. A participant from Honduras threw light on the gaps in prevention of HIV infection among the most vulnerable populations. A community health worker from Brazil elaborated on the social determinants impacting tuberculosis. A participant from Nigeria shared their concern around the indiscriminate use of antibiotics by both patients and healthcare providers leading to AMR in the region. Qualitative responses to the question, why do these diseases pose the greatest infection threat indicated the drivers that are perceived to be associated with the risk of these infection threats, some of which were found to be climate change, poor diagnostic capabilities and poor case management for malaria, effects of COVID-19, poor drug procurement and AMR for TB, issues with treatment adherence, supply and resistance for HIV AIDS, and poor sanitation and climate change for cholera. Key cross-cutting themes that emerged were climate change due to its impact on vector distribution and water quality and scarcity, COVID-19, due to effect on the healthcare systems and funding re reprioritization, as well as socioeconomic factors, including poverty and overcrowding. The regional workshops constituted round two of the Delphi method as the participants informed how the findings from the survey were to be refined, further understood and focused. Responses from the workshop guided the categorization and groupings of the diseases. This stage enabled further investigation into the prioritization of the following groupings. Vector-borne diseases, viral hemorrhagic fevers, neglected tropical diseases, and responses related to resistance were grouped together from the relevant individual responses. This graph represents the comparison of disease groupings proposed by workshop participants with the highest prioritized infection threats. The analysis revealed that vector-borne diseases were the leading disease group of concern, followed by tuberculosis. In the vector-borne disease category, malaria and dengue were seen as the highest prioritized threats. In the viral hemorrhagic fever category, Ebola and Lassa fever were the two highest prioritized individual infection threats and have been highlighted. 
Tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, COVID-19 were some of the ungrouped responses and referred to infection threats identified by participants that were not subjected to additional grouping and represent the total number of survey responses only for those individual infection threats. Thank you, and I will pass it over to Julio Canario Guzman for sharing findings on the types of research. Hi, I'm Julio Canario Guzman from Ethicos Foundation and the uh, TJSN in Latin America. Participants were asked to identify regional errors concerning the sources of reservoir of disease and factors influencing their escalation which they felt represented research priorities in their setting. And specifically, we asked participants to identify knowledge or racial gaps, which, which if addressed, would contribute to the development and use of interventions for disease control. This was a close-ended question. Participants were required, required to prioritize up to three response options from a list of 12 to determine research teams. In the next slides, we are going to show you some comparison of the research team ranking at the low, middle income country and high income countries and regional levels. The key finding was that more research on disease detection, transmission, and also the socioeconomic and cultural factors drivers of disease detection is needed to combat the greatest infectious threats. You can see that these findings show in a strong consensus that improving the detection and investigation of disease threats is, is perceived to be key to escalating disease control and to tackling the uh, escalating infectious disease threats. Across all regions, we have a strong consensus that we need to enable tools and also to uh, create or improve facilities um, uh, to enable timely disease detection, which is this is a key thing that came out from, from this work. Also, disease transmission, it was the second one, the second highest. Uh, and we can present here like an universal consensus that further research into understanding disease transmission is necessary. All participants sets in the Latin American uh, region, as you can see, uh, have these, uh, these as a second option as prioritization. The third one, which is social science, was identified as a poorly funded and under study component of infectious disease research across all the study regions. That's how we see that this is the third priority uh, that have been identified. So this talks about that we need to consider the socioeconomic and sociocultural factors that are essential in the design of cultural sensitive and relevant interventions. Some of you will ask about the ethics. Why ethics is show here at the lower priority in response to the super question. So this loss prioritization was discussed heavily in the workshops. Some participants felt that this was likely to be due uh, to ethics being considered as basically ethics review and probably not ethics as a research, as a research topic itself. Other commented that uh, community engagement in social science came high in this result, and probably ethics considerations are also considered within the scope of community engagement in social science, and that's as a standalone topic. You will see in the next slide as well the qualitative findings. The workshops discussion help apps to understand why you have made your choices. So during the workshops, in every region, participants have the opportunity to share their beliefs regarding the responses, the options they made. And one of the aspects that we identify is that there is, in terms of detection and investigation, 
based lack of diagnostic facilities, the tools and support this environment owing to resource limitation and low skills, weak laboratory capacity, weak capacity of local surveillance systems, both human and animal, and poor understanding of epidemiology and etiology of infectious diseases. One academic in Sierra Leone mentioned that very microbiology diagnostic capacity can help reduce antibiotic use. So this is in terms of detection and investigation. A second topic that came out, it was regarding transmission. And the quality of findings suggested that disease transmission represented a knowledge deficient, a poorly understood and neglected component of infection in single search across oral study regions. The third component, which is the socioeconomic and cultural factors. So participants in the workshop felt that research knowledge in the area will make more efficient and effective interventions. Several, several participants also uh, mentioned that this is uh, this is an area which there is an impact of social behavioral factors on disease emergence and transmission, which is also poorly understood. There is other issues of non-adherence, socially excluded groups, which are unable to assess the proper care. There is a need for culturally appropriate interventions at all levels. And finally, we need to strengthen the use of research outputs and research implementation. That's in terms of the three main priorities we identify in the quantitative study and then the qualitative view of those priorities. Finally, the next slide, some participants cited the diagnostics is a significant challenge in our practice environment. As you can see, also a microbiologist from India, he mentioned that laboratory diagnosis of specific infections is still weak in terms of availability, accessibility, recognition of need of such tests and maltake. And he mentioned that improvement in this area will help not only patient care, but to understand many other aspects. Also from Peru, we have this comment regarding the antimicrobial resistance, that there is a need to increase antimicrobial resistance work and research in the COVID-19 pandemic has filled this problem. Also from Uganda, Uganda is still lagging behind in terms of diagnostic capacity, especially with viral hemorrhagic fevers. There is still one facility in the country that tasked with diagnosing BFF. So across all the regions, we have these important comments that need to be considered. And finally, in Mexico, a doctor from a hospital mentioned, in the space where we work, sometimes there are not the necessary tools of the investigation and detection of infectious diseases and so detection is sometimes late. So those are some of the comments that we want to show you about our study results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening uh, from wherever you may be uh, across the world. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Julio and Saivia for giving us this uh, picture around the disease priorities, as well as the different types of research, uh, uh, types of research that have, have to be done. So my name is Pacific, uh, I'm from Rwanda, the Global Health Network Rwanda. So as my previous speakers, uh, so in this section, we are going to see the different findings from the questions around the barriers and enablers. And the participants were asked uh, several questions around what is stopping them to undertake research into uh, sources of infectious diseases and what are the factors that are driving uh, this, the disease escalation. So they were also uh, given opportunity uh, to answer, to share what they think about the enablers uh, to undertake research into uh, sources of infectious 
diseases. So briefly, uh, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Okay, so uh, this first uh, figure is all about the different factors that were identified as barriers to researchers. And as you can see, uh, understanding actually uh, the barriers is very crucial because once identified, it can lead to more robust or reliable or even impactful research findings. So the most of uh, barriers that were identified include access to funding, research management support, research skills training, access to research equipment and technology. And uh, what is very interesting here to highlight is that all the elements uh, reported here uh, uh, showed a minimal variation, which means they didn't vary a lot across the different uh, study respondent. Next, please. So yes, so this uh, second uh, figure shows, uh, it's, it's a summary about the different factors that were uh, reported as enablers from the different uh, study participants. And as you can see, the, the different participants uh, perceived the research skills training, institutional support for research, access to funding as the major factors that are uh, motivating them uh, to do research. And uh, I really like this figure because uh, it reminds me of one of the papers I was previously reading, showing that the top or seven science producing countries worldwide are the same seven countries uh, in terms of research infrastructure, in terms of research facilities. So next, please. Yeah, so as I said, uh, uh, we also collected the qualitative uh, data and from what, what we can have here. So this qualitative data reinforces what has been uh, reported in the quantitative findings. Uh, so the major uh, uh, themes that were uh, collected are access to funding, research skills training, and research uh, management support. So in terms of access to funding, people were sharing the experience uh, whereby they reported that they highlighted the lack of local funding uh, sources, for example, the limited opportunities for young researchers, and even the high publication costs. So in terms of research skills training, uh, they were highlighting all the need of increasing this uh, research uh, training programs, especially for the healthcare professionals, the young researchers, etc. So for the research management support and institutional support for research, actually it was very highlighted that uh, the most of institutions need, for example, to support research, to have research agenda, uh, to, to, to support in terms of grant management, uh, etc. Next, please. Yes, so uh, here we have uh, a slide about the most important uh, uh, quote from the study respondent. Uh, so one of, uh, for example, of uh, the participant in Brazil was showing that there is a lack of research skills training, and then publication is unlikely. And he was trying to show that the policymakers now, the program managers, even the academicians are now understanding the need of investing uh, in this uh, capacity building programs. So one participant uh, on the other side from Nepal was showing that there is also a need to increase the, uh, the mentorship programs because uh, if we want scientists, young researchers to write very competitive grant, we really need to make sure that they have all they need. And also the language, the English language was uh, reported as a barrier. Uh, and apart from these training skills, there is also on the other side, uh, some participants, for example, from uh, Nigeria, that were highlighting that uh, in the context, context they were, where they work, it is very hard uh, to get institutional support or even a political will. And they were highlighting uh, even that the most of funders, they don't support this kind of uh, training programs, they are just supporting the research. So on the other side, uh, uh, what I really liked, uh, one of the quotes from uh, Zimbabwe, there is a participant who highlighted that in the countries or the settings uh, without local funding or platforms or options, there is a huge loss of research talent 
uh, two other sectors as the career stability is so poor. So briefly, this is uh, what has been uh, reported uh, from the qualitative uh, findings. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Now over to Trudy. Thank you very much. And um, it was really great hearing the results being presented um, by my three colleagues. It's um, It's been a remarkable process of study, as, I, as I'm sure is, I hope, coming across from all of us. So I think this is where um, I'm going to prompt you as well. I'm, I'm going to um, give a bit of an overview of the thinking that we've had around interpreting these findings. And this is from the discussion that um, we've had with the uh, Scientific Steering Committee, some of which are on the um, on this call, I'm glad to say, um, but also from um, as we've been writing up these results. The most important thing I want to say first is um, this is um, such a massive volume of data. And we'll come back to this at the end, because we really hope that some of you come forward and, and want to run your own analysis on these findings. And the responsibility of interpreting this data and, re and even doing the analysis is felt huge because it was such um, a remarkable achievement, really, to have uh, such a high volume of responses. We had 3,700 people reply to the survey, as Ryan um, explained to you. And then we um, had to, to select from those a really diverse group to attend the workshops for that step two. So, you know, in a real Delphi approach, as Ryan explained, we had the um, the survey first and we asked these questions and, and, and the most... Um, remarkable thing of the survey as well is that people took the time to do the checkbox answers, but they ev they wrote a vast amount um, into the open questions as well. And this was really important, as I'm going to talk to um, talk to you about in a second. That um, it, it was one thing having people say, "Well, I th I think mal malaria is the disease I'm worrying about most," but we really wanted to know why. And um, and they told us they really told us. <laughs> and and this is the um, the really strong part of this um, study, I think, that, that um, we've been given these really clear pictures of what the diseases are and what type of research should happen, what the barriers are, um, but the um, respondents in the huge, huge numbers explained why. And so what does that mean and and, um, and what's our sort of responsibility on, on thinking about these data? And so we really need to consider that um, the data was these the significant volume and the significant numbers and the diversity across the globe and so the um the opportunity we have here is really uh thinking about this in this big overall way we're looking at it now but also focusing down on these particular questions so firstly i think in terms of the demographic graphics we've got a really important um point to note that we have this real global answer here and, it, and in the absence of um, any other form of research, it's really um, it's really a unique data set because it's almost impossible to do a biological study across that whole uh, landscape and get a really empirical answer from um, from measuring biological outcomes. But here, um, this vast group of people, I'm sure many of you on the call, um, took the time to say, these are the diseases I'm worried about. These are the research um, types of research that need to happen and these are the barriers. And and then explain what they're seeing in front of them right now. And I think that's the point that we really need to think about. And so while I'm sharing our collective thoughts on this as the researchers and the and the scientific group, which I'm, I'm, I'm voicing all of these discussions here, please write in the Q&A as well what your thoughts are on this, because we're going to open this up in a second and it'd be really great um, to hear from you. And so the fact that we've got... Um, this wide range that changed from the first round, which was the survey, and in the Delphi process, the, the first set of questions said, which diseases do you think are the most important? And and they were given open uh, um, the open opportunity to answer those questions. And in that first round, that's where we had the big three come through, HIV, TB, malaria. And so these weren't the um, the rapidly emerging infections, the respiratory diseases we see um, and, the, and the Global North referred to, these were the sort of long term diseases of poverty that have, that have been grinding away for decades and that m many of us have spent our careers working on. And they still came through at, at really high numbers. And in the survey, we also asked, well, well why is that the perception that these are, are, are so so much at risk of escalation? You know, not what you're working on now, the diseases you think are going to escalate. 
and the and what came through from the survey and then again was discussed in the workshops really closely was that these um are um being driven by um social economic factors and also climate change and that climate change is um moving people moving mosquitoes and vectors but also um driving even worsening the social economic factors i'm going to call out um the discussion particularly on amr because um we, we we've been discussing this a lot as a team because we asked people to list what diseases they felt were the worst um risk the highest risk of escalation and and many people wrote amr or, or a similar phrase and of course amr itself isn't a disease um but we've included in the ranking because that's what people were recording as a disease so it's also comes up again of course in uh, what type of research should we be doing to tackle this and tackling the amr threat um but it's really clear that it came across everything so amr really came through as a disease area and a type of research and 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 also um you know one of the one of the causative factors as well um so step 1 was the the survey and came up with really the big 3 in the global south um, and and quite a difference as one of the people in the in the questions has already commented um, in the global north a bit more of a focus on respiratory diseases and the emergent um, uh, you know unknowns and then as a Delphi process dictates what you do is you take the big survey responses and then we took those to the workshops so we had uh, you know three workshops in three regions and we could bring these groups together and we'd select them across this diverse range of people. And we could say, OK, so the survey response came up with these data. Tell us what this means. Put this in context now. Give us some experiences and what have you, what you think um, you, you experience in your own setting or, or why in this region were the answers they were given. And this is the Delphi process of reducing down and get a greater clarity. And so because we'd asked people to record those open questions, in the second reducing down Delphi step, then we could dig in and say, okay, the response that came through from the workshops was to group those diseases. Um, and so the second round, which uh, Salvia presented the graph, uh, when that's where we saw the grouping of diseases, which was dictated by the workshops in that Delphi process of reducting. And this is where we saw the really tall response from vector-borne diseases. Um, and then, um, the diseases that followed on for that which came out um really strongly as well you know still seeing um, a really high instance of, of of amr again and um and and tb as well and hiv and so still the remaining drivers though uh, didn't really change and this is socioeconomic factors and um and climate change and climate change driving the socioeconomic factors as well so what type of research was a really important um, question to go on to and obviously part of Welcome's remit for wanting to set their strategy and really do this listening exercise. And this was really interesting. And you saw from the graph um, that we had quite a consistency across the globe. So more difference was seen in the what diseases across the globe. But when we talked about what type of research, this was a much more consistent message. And it was really clear that um, the researchers feel that the priorities should be placed on detecting um, where these diseases are appearing. I mean, then that's not really a surprise is it? if we're thinking around mosquitoes and people moving and perhaps vector-borne diseases like malaria and dengue and um, yellow fever, chikungunya appearing in places where they haven't been before or re-emerging, we need to be detecting, right, of course. And so that really tied up. Um, we need to be doing surveillance. We need to understand the burden and disease characteristics. But then the um, the next sort of set of uh, high priority research areas really shifted to a much more socioeconomic, public health, community engagement. So understanding the perceptions in the community, what people understand about the diseases, what we could do in terms of research to understand public health interventions, and um, and and getting those to be um, to really work in those settings. So I think it really tied in actually, and um, and what people were worried about about the diseases that uh, they were seeing as escalating threats, the type of research needed really followed those, you know. And often I think lots of the emphasis is on the big clinical trials and that sort of uh, top of the pyramid, but really we were hearing quite a different story here about needing to do you know really community based research, understanding what the gaps are. So lastly, going on to um, the barriers and enablers. This was um, really nicely covered by 
Pasipik summarising these for us. And I think the, the point here really is that um, the, the barriers, um, obviously um, funding would be called out by everybody, but it was quite nuanced. And this was really useful in the discussions. And it was access to funding, you know, being able to know what uh, calls were around and have those calls designed and set up to be appropriate for this type of research and people working in these different settings. Equity, equity and access, equity for um, female researchers. And we had lots of really great discussions around um, younger researchers and early career development, which um, I'm sure welcome. We're definitely listening to, and you'll probably hear more from that um, more from that later on. Um, we we've we heard a lot from Pacific about the, the focus on um, access to research skills training, and also the need for people to work in teams and collaborate. One of the strongest barriers that came through as well was um, lack of institutional support for research. And if if people are working in an environment where they're not given the mandate and support to research to do research, then it's very hard for them to step up and 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 really find those opportunities and make time in their day to do research. So then, if we look at the um, at the enablers, and this was a really important part that we brought into this, we wanted to know not just. Um, you know why research is difficult but we wanted people to come to the workshops and to tell us in the survey what they actually found that they could do and have done that that really um got over those barriers and made research feasible and this was a really nice finding um because it i think this is the good news piece right because um the the findings were very um homogeneous across the globe um there really was no difference um between uh, the global north and the global south and even the regions and also there was no difference between disease areas um, or even type of research. And so this is really good news because it means that we can tackle these um, and we can do this. Um, we can bring these uh, cross cutting ways to, to upskill research teams and also to, um, to really enact some of these um, solutions to the barriers. And, and the barriers and the enablers really matched each other's. So we know that we need to tackle um, in a really systematic way um, people being given the time and opportunity to do research in their workplaces. Um, obviously, research skills sharing, um, teaching teams how to do the whole um, spectrum of health research and all the component parts they need to do, and also being able to work um, in networks and in collaborations. So um, we do think this was the really good news um, part of the story because it could really be helpful for those uh, looking um, to do more um, about research system strengthening and capacity building. Here is a vast body of data um, that really can help uh, guide those programs. So I'll I'll stop there, but just to say, um, we really did only scratch the surface on the analysis of this data. And it, and we did this global look um, and, and and I think it's it's really informative and 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 I and I can't understate the responsibility we feel of making sure that these voices are heard because this is a large and significant body of data and that strong message around vector-borne diseases and um, driven by climate change and socioeconomic factors and what we need to do um, to enable that research to happen in in the places where um, this burden is going to appear most um, were really clear. Um, so looking forward to hearing from you all in the Q&A um, and discussing this more in the open session shortly. So I'll pass back to my colleagues at Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. And thank you for everybody making the time to join this webinar today. Um, my name is Petra Fay. I'm a research manager in the epidemics and epidemiology team within the infectious diseases team here at Wellcome. And together with my colleague, Anna, we will be sharing with you some of the implications from this research for Wellcome um, and how within the infectious diseases team, we are using these key findings to inform our long-term funding approach. So to reiterate uh, what Josie had mentioned earlier on in the webinar, our aims really are to support our goals to ensure that we focus on tackling the biggest barriers where science can make a difference. This research prioritization exercise was really our first step as a listening exercise to help inform our long-term funding approach, having the opportunity to speak directly with researchers in endemic burden countries, uh, to really understand how we as an organization can better support research where there is a high unmet medical need. As you've heard from uh, the earlier talks in this webinar, some of the key themes that came through, may I have the next slide please, sorry, were really around common drivers um, 
from this study, and that is on climate change and also disease resistance. And these are two components that we are taking into strong consideration in how we design our future funding strategies within the infectious diseases team, but also across our other research programs here at Wellcome. Next slide, please. So thinking about how we are working forward to address key research priorities and drivers of escalating infectious diseases, I'm showing on this slide here two of our focus areas as an example of those that we are developing and refining our focus in how we fund going forward. One of these is around vector-borne diseases, particularly mosquito-borne diseases, where we will develop this area focusing on select viral pathogens to really understand emergence and spread, thinking about immunological responses, cross-reactivity, clinical disease, and ultimately developing effective control strategies in this area. Another example area is around drug resistant infections. And this is building on previous welcome investments over the last 10 years in this space and refining this for select bacterial and fungal pathogens to really understand the mechanisms of resistance, but also to develop new treatments and new innovative preventative tools in this space. But we continue to be consultative in how we design and inform our future funding strategies. As I said, this prioritization exercise was really a first step in hearing from the community, particularly hearing from new voices to Welcome. And we will continue to perform similar exercises to inform where Welcome can have the greatest impact for the communities most affected. And I'll just hand over to my colleague, Anna, who will explain in more detail about how we have done this so far. Thank you, Petra. So uh, my name is uh, Anna Tukhovin. I am a senior research manager uh, here at Welcome. And I will now briefly tell you um, about the next steps we've taken with vector-borne diseases. So uh, what we've done uh, is after taking on these new approaches, we have convened a arbovirus strategy meeting um, in December. So we've consulted uh, around 100 experts uh, in this area. Uh, welcome. And we really deep dived uh, in uh, understanding research gaps in epidemiology, transmission dynamics, and immunology of uh, arbovirus research. But also, we were discussing strategy for preparedness. And these discussions with the experts really determined the key knowledge gaps and global research needs uh, in this area. And the uh, areas that were really highlighted during these discussions with the experts was the strong need to understand more about the immunology, about dengue and Zika uh, infections. So next slide, please. Thank you. So what we have decided to do is open up a funding opportunity. Uh, this will launch in the beginning of April. And it will really focus on the co-circulation of both dengue and Zika and the implications on public health. And the outcomes uh, of this funding will really aim to support the global efforts to understand and predict the spread of these pathogens, especially in the areas where epidemiological data on these pathogens are limited. So we will not be able to answer more questions about this funding call at this stage, but please have a look at our website in the first week of April uh, to understand more about the scope and eligibility of this funding call. And just to tell you, we will also be running webinars uh, after the launch uh, to, uh, to let you know more about the scope and eligibility um, criteria. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass you back to Petra. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next slide, please. So previously, that was an example of how we've taken uh, your feedback and put that into action. Um, but when we think about the third question that we'd asked around enablers and barriers to conducting research, we recognize that there are different pressures in different geographical regions. And as an organization, Wellcome Trust will continue to evolve our approach to support how we fund and embed better practices into our ways of working. One of these areas is continuing to maintain engagement with the global research community using different tools so that we can broaden who we engage with, ensuring that we speak to different stakeholders, different organizations that are representative of different expertise areas, allowing us to adapt to the research needs of the communities most affected. As mentioned earlier, 
we have a strong focus on multidisciplinary approaches, again, recognizing the importance of different expertise areas and also driving an inclusive research culture and embedding equality, diversity and inclusivity in the way we fund. Next slide, please. Some of the ways where we are showing how we are adapting to the funding application process is that we are giving more time for applicants to prepare and submit their applications at the preliminary and full application stages. And this is really to support a broader variety of applicants and their success in applying to our funding schemes here at Wellcome, particularly from low and middle income countries and across different career stages. During the funding process, we will be delivering webinars to guide applicants and provide clarity to key questions around the application process. And we will also be providing feedback after preliminary stages to help support with future applications. This is an ongoing area for Welcome. We will continue to evolve and refine our funding processes to make these more open and applicable to a broader research audience. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we are developing and broadening different research priorities within the infectious diseases team. So please do keep an eye out for future opportunities. Do subscribe to our newsletters and you can use the links shown in the slide deck here for access to those for the most up-to-date information for new funding opportunities. You can also go direct to our funding schemes page on our website that will list all open funding opportunities, not only for the infectious diseases team, but also for our discovery research team that is open to more broader research themes across different career stages. For any funding inquiries, please use the link third second from the bottom to contact us. And also you can reach us directly at the epidemics and epidemiology team using the link at the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Trudy as we open the Q&A session. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, really exciting to see how um, Welcome have responded to these findings um, so quickly and, and, and truly listened. So. Um, that's really exciting, and I'm sure everybody was dotting down those um, those links, and and we'll be able to share them with everybody really widely. So great, we've got. Um, I've been scribbling away. We've got a fantastic uh, set of questions in the chat. So what I'm going to do in the in the Q and A is do um, pop some more on. Um, I've got uh, the team behind who will um, enable people to have um, have the microphone, um, and I'm going to call out a few people just to set the question. Um, and it, some of them are just really great comments um, on their own experience. So um, so do just explain um, your position on these and then we can um, we, we can discuss them and I'll and I'll and I'll ask my colleagues to either put their hands up if they want to take the question or I'm going to um, pick on people. And um, there's also a few people um, on the meeting that uh, who I know could answer some of these questions incredibly well. Um, some many of the colleagues um, from the regions uh, can answer them way better than than any of us. Um, so, um, Jacqueline, to put you on the spot, first of all, could you please um, explain your point you made around um, AMR? And um, and I'll see if um, anybody wants to just pick up that point. Um, so, uh, Louis, could you give Jacqueline the, the microphone, please? If she can. Uh, if she's Thank able. you, Trudy. Oh, well, uh, it is because we see here in countries such as like uh, Honduras, uh, in the clinical practice is very often the complaints about drug resistance and uh, the um, misuse, the misuse and abuse of uh, antibiotics. Then, uh, uh, and we know that this is also uh, true for the Latin America. So uh, my comment was that um, even though it was within the top uh, topics, it could be higher, but uh, maybe it's just an opportunity to approach it because uh, it may also indicate that we are not aware of all the relevance of, of this problem over. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And um, I think what I'm gonna do actually is follow your question um, with, 
with Lovenish, if you don't mind, because you made another really brilliant point about AMR. Um, and just to reiterate what I was saying in, in the interpretation that um, AMR came through so strongly all the way through um, because it contributes to the um, the issues with vector-borne diseases because we could be facing problems with, say, antimalarials or, or vaccine efficacy. It came through in the need for research to understand things like um, in access to medicines and appropriate use of antibiotics. And it came through, obviously, in people listing AMR as a disease itself. So um, really important finding and something we should probably be digging more in um, if people want to do further analysis on this. So um, I'll let the panel get their thoughts together as well and see if anybody wants to say anything. But um, can we see if uh, Lovnish also wants to talk about this because they made a great point about AMR in hospitals. Okay, hello. Uh... Hello everyone, I hope I'm audible. So I've listed I am a clinician. I absolutely agree with the other perspective that community, you can talk of all things, Zika, malaria, and every other thing. But when they you know get complicated, they always run to the hospitals, be it the primary, secondary, or tertiary. And what I keep on witnessing is the indiscriminate use of antibiotics. And recently we just lost a patient. All negative, all resistant. I'm just wondering, it was a very much low on the priority. I don't, don't, don't know the reasons exactly why. Is it the low law knowledge? Is it a really lack of awareness? Because in my country, uh, I do believe there is a indiscriminate use. So I would love to hear what the Global Health Network would uh, like to say on that and uh, what are your future plans about AMR, enhancing the knowledge and the, say the capacity. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'll just do an immediate plug for the community of practice for AMR, um, which um, one of my colleagues can drop in the chat. And Lovnish, we'd really do be delighted if you wanted to uh, join that, um, because that's exactly for that purpose. Um, does anybody else on the panel want to talk about AMR in the context of the research, um, particularly in the I, team? I don't mind. So I think those two comments are critical, and it's something from a welcome perspective we've had a drug resistance infection team established since 2017, um, led by Tim Jinks, and which is now included within the Infectious Disease Strategic Program. And they have funded some, I would say, fundamental um, pieces of, I would say, evidence to really shape what the priorities need to be. So I'll, I'll cite one around the GRAM study that was really pivotal because it just highlighted the, the lack of data, particularly from a low middle income country setting and how that really needs to, to be improved. And so for me, it wasn't so surprising to not see it raised high up on the agenda. I think it is one of the, uh, it, it, you know, from the researchers we talk to, of course, it's, it's the main priority, <laughs> um, but often we're seeing in the community understanding the interactions of antibiotic usage and how it's coming, you know, it's more observable in the clinic, less less known what's happening in the community. So more work, more research is required to do this. And I think that's something that Welcome feels very strongly um, that there has to be a target on building that evidence base to really shape those discussions for prioritization, where the funding needs to go in country, where the, you know, I would say community engagement and education programs needs to go. So I, I completely agree with this. Um, and But it is also a cautionary what we see from this survey, which has been you know, a phenomenal piece of evidence, as Trudy's talk about, we do take it as one data point of what we're hearing, and we have to work with other other forms of information that that we you know to compile really what are how we're going to focus on something, what are the priorities, and uh, where we focus on. But I, I think it's a it's a great point to raise. Thank you. Excellent. So. Um, I'm just going to completely jump topics now because um, just to go back into the data, so just to um, to warn Louis, I think we might need uh, the slide that was in Julio's set with the um, with the different types of research, just because I think this came up a couple of times. And so, um, Duncan, you made two really great questions that Ryan talked through in the in the chat. But I think just good to um, just bring that slide back up on the screen if if you can, Louis. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, so Duncan asked about um, what the different colours meant in the graph, and then you made another question as well, which I'm just trying to find on the screen, um, about the about the prioritisation in the region. So, um, and I know Ryan can answer those questions for you um, really well. So, um, Duncan, over to you. Um, so on this graph, it was just what does the colours colours mean, and then the question we had for 
how people were responding? Was it people responding for what they felt were the priorities in their country? Or was it what they felt were the priorities in their region or something? I'm just thinking about, so if you're a researcher in the UK researching diseases in sub-Saharan Africa, what what angle would you, was the question pitched? Because that could potentially impact people's answers. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Ryan, over to you. Thanks, Duncan, and thanks, Trudy. Yeah, a really important question, I think, to understand the contextualization of these results. So the question was pitched as what are the priorities in your setting? So we didn't define that setting. It could have been their institution. It could have been their country. It could have been their region. That was open to interpretation from each of the participants. But of course, it was the personalized aspect of what they felt as a researcher, as a healthcare professional, what they felt were their greatest priorities for where these types of, or what types of research needs to be focused on, or what diseases were the greatest uh, escalating threat in their setting. And then just to comment on, on the colors as well, just to clarify, um, so yeah, on that slide, the uh, anything that is green is ranked as a higher priority. So when we see that darker green, those items are ranked as a higher priority than from the participants, and the red were the lowest priorities ranked by the participants. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm just going to put, I've got a whole list here I want to go through, but I don't want us to lose this one and run out of time um, because I really always love to hear these uh, these contributions because it's so important and it came through in the results. So, Louis, you, you wrote um, something on the chat about young researchers. Um, please, can we give you the mic and possibly even have your camera on because um, tell us your story and and that you um why you think we should be focusing on on young researchers because this really always helps guide us and so and sorry to put you on the spot but here's your moment okay hello Hi, yeah sure okay i'm louis from malawi i think we have uh, we have started like a digestion group uh, network in malawi we are just building the team but the uh, when we are trying to build some of the research when I, in our team, like in our hospital health facilities, most of them, it looks like they are lacking behind. They don't know, they don't have even skills on how to do the research, but they, they know the gaps, but they still need someone to get them. So we have been trying to maybe to develop some proposals, but I think there's some other they have tried, they have not passed through. So I feel like if you can have maybe special training or a system that you can be able to work together, I think, I think we'll be able to to develop so many studies from our end. And the, I think we have a lot of opportunity where we can do so many studies in Malawi. So we have a good number of facilities that we're working with through the Global Health Network, Malawi and the Oxford. And I feel like if we can have those training and then the access to resources and other things, I think that can also support the system. And then, then you can have many, many information or maybe something that the disaster that you have done, the studies. So I feel like if you can have a, an opportunity for the training of those teams, because you have a good number of people who are part of the DJHL, and apart from that, you have a good number from the investors and the other facilities. So yeah, if you go full on the, I think most of the studies, if you go around, you find that you don't have so many publication studies on the network. So if, if you can do that, they can also support. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Really beautifully put. And you pretty much articulated what really came through in both the barriers and enablers um, really, really consistently in really yeah. strong numbers and, and it actually mirrors lots of the research we have. Christine, I'm just going to put you on the spot because this is uh, as another young researcher and trying to tackle this. Um, um, maybe just mention broadly some of the things that, that we're hoping to do after this to help connect and then I'll pass back to welcome. Certainly. And it's so good to hear from Louis. He's a representative um, at TGHN Malawi, so it's exciting to hear um, his voice and to hear his opinions. Um, as you said, Trudy, there's a lot of opportunity, not just coming from this data that we're presenting and the work that we're presenting today, but overall working with the Global Health Network. Um, but just speaking specifically from the particular opportunities that are readily present from the work that has come from the year's work of research so far, there's opportunities for people to make use of this data set, which I'll be talking about shortly, about how you can access it to make use of it for yourselves and for your teams to continue to ask questions and to build on it. Um, so I'm excited to talk about it in, in the next session, Trudy. Thank you.
Thanks, Christine. And just um, over to welcome because uh, we we all really um, picked this up through the workshops as well, didn't we? So it's 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 really good to hear. So I agree. It's such an important area. And for, for Welcome, you know, one of the ways we've been approaching it, working with Science for Africa Foundation in particular over the last um, decade has been around promoting our kind of DELTAs approach, which is really around research training um, and different speci specialties. It goes beyond infectious diseases. Um, so there was a, a recent um, uh, last year, there was the recent next phase of funding for that. So I think in terms of targeted areas to support around, particularly on certain skills, not only just on research um, skills, but on grant writing, there are thoughts underway at Welcome on how we would do this, particularly in, in particular geographical locations. Some of that would include the African continent. Um, but these are things that, I, you know, we can't we can't publicly say as yet, but it, it's, a, it's a great emphasis for us at the moment. And hopefully we'll be able to share that information soon. Thanks, Josie. That's that's great. And I think um, we've we've just got such strong information on how we get data now from this, this study on particularly what um, interventions can help to in that um, getting over those barriers. So um, more to be done there, which Christine will talk about. Um, changing the subject again, um, I'd like to ask um, Apollo to speak if you're happy to, because I think you wanted to understand um, or just really comment on the difference between the findings in high and low income countries on the disease priorities so i think that's you know quite good to orientate us back to there so could you just uh let us know what your observations were and what your question was around that apollo that would be great so my question was about uh, the different uh, diseases that were listed as top priorities for the different settings basically the lmics and then the high income country. We know very well that uh, at times the priorities in the two groups differ and uh, the globe the north tends to put out calls for disease areas that uh, affect them more than diseases that are really affecting the global south. And that in a way raises issues because uh, researchers have been forced to sort of placed in a situation where they have to study or design research that addresses questions that are actually not high priorities for their settings, but because they have to respond to some of the calls. So if you can make a comment on, on how that is going to be uh, how these findings are going to affect that kind of uh, dynamic. Thank you, Apollo. That was really beautifully put. So, just to remind um, everybody on the call, what we saw was um, when asked about which diseases um, are a priority, there was it was it was fairly uniform across the global south, um, and and then quite different to the global north um, with those. Um, you know, vector-borne diseases and HIV, TB, malaria really featuring in the global south and a, more of an emphasis on um, respiratory diseases and um, the emergent um, pandemic type situation with COVID and those sorts of things in the global north. So that very stark difference. And I think interestingly, with the other questions around type of research and the barriers and enablers, it, there wasn't the difference. So this that was really clear. So um, uh, so lots and lots of other questions around that that we can think about, but um, over to you, welcome for your thoughts on that? I, I mean, this is a really a fundamental question um, because we know that where the funding goes, it, it shapes so many things, it, you know, and this is part of the limitation of, of the, the research study in, in general, because where the funding goes, it builds up the research field um, and the research, research ecosystem, particularly for, for select pathogens. And um, we saw that, you know, it was quite challenging to find researchers who had a fungal background to come and be representing their views at these meetings simply because that is often a challenge because the research community is, is much more smaller, often because it's not deemed as a higher priority um, and so the funding isn't directed. So it does have big implications. I would say, you know, from a welcome perspective, and we can only speak from how we would use this information and particularly because our focus in our strategy, you know, we're not linked to having to support research in any particular country we don't have those limitations so we are choosing to have a focus on really focusing on 
those communities, those researchers who are undertaking the research in their countries where the diseases are rife, where the biggest problem is. And I think that's the key focus for us of how do we do this and how we how do we build that sustainable ecosystem? So that's from our infectious disease strategic program. We are more targeted on that because we really do feel we have to listen to what are the, the research questions really required. It also changes when we talk about multidisciplinary uh, in our approach. It doesn't just mean from the academic field, we have to bring in a range of stakeholders into help shaping the research questions to ensure Sure that there will be, in the end, acceptability to the research being generated that pull through for, into the public health, into the decision making system. So this, it's it's trusted data. It's actually appropriate data and information. So a lot of it has to go into how we shape, um, you know, how we fund in, into that. So I take that on board. It's it's definitely always a risk um, out there. But from a welcome perspective, we're very focused on on this particular point. But thank you. Back to you, Trudy. Thanks very much. Um, really important area to cover. So um, I think that was that was great. Um, can I give the microphone, please, to Ebenezer, who's put a brilliant um, question in the chat? And this brings up the point that came out in the findings around um, the type of research that needs to happen. And there was that emphasis on on discoverability of um, of where the burden lies and surveillance and and um, and diagnostics but also the other really significant area around um, public health and social science, um, which I think is, is is really what Ebenezer is getting at. So over to you, Ebenezer, to please uh, phrase your question for us. All right. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to say a thank you to the organizers of the program. My question is in connection with interventions. And when I say interventions, I mean, there are some of the problems that we research on that if we had some sort of social interventions, they could be addressed. So I'm, I'm speaking from a certain context. In the northern half of Ghana, for instance, in most of the regions, typhoid fevers are endemic. And if you look at the situation there, it is also probably also because even though there are primary sources like rivers, which could have been treated to provide drinking water for the populace, people actually drink from open dams. And these dams are fed with water from surfaces. And uh, there are other social factors like opentification. So I think that if we want to, for instance, address typhoid fevers, it is going to be an ongoing problem. No matter what we do, we're going to keep on battling on these issues like antibiotic resistance. It is primarily because people do not have access to treated water. So I wanted to direct the question to funders such as Welcome Trust. Would Welcome Trust also in the future consider certain interventions of that sort? And not just social interventions, but also supporting health infrastructure. So one thing that also uh, I also want to share in this context also is the fact that in the North, it runs through the northern half of the country. And what we witnessed was that during the COVID outbreak, a lot of attention was shifted from issues like meningitis and the focus was on COVID. Vaccinations, for instance, were neglected. So beyond COVID now, we have seen lots of outbreaks of measles, which used not to be so. But another problem is that countries may not have the capacity to produce vaccines to be able to address some of these outbreaks. And the last time I checked from WHO, I realized that as of February, second week of February, Africa was battling over 100 infectious disease outbreaks across the continent. So in as much as we are going to research the problem, I think that supporting infrastructure, supporting things like um, vaccine production on the continent is also a major thing to look at. Otherwise, I personally feel that we will keep on researching the problem. The issues of antibiotic resistance will keep on emerging because in where I work in the northern half of the country, everybody knows the symptoms for typhoid fevers, but clearly you're not able to delineate between typhoid fever and malaria, which present with the same symptoms. So people actually go ahead to abuse antibiotics, thinking that they already know the symptoms for the condition. And the fact that everybody also knows that it is endemic. So as soon as somebody has certain symptoms that mimics any of them, the person just walks to a shop and buys antibiotics. And then at the end of the day, we keep on battling issues like antibiotic resistance. But I believe if we could address the matter from the roots, which is providing 
access to treated water, I believe that it will be able to address some of these conditions in different parts okay. of Africa. So I just wanted to throw it to a welcome track. It's a welcome trust considering, aside funding research, is welcome trust also going to consider in the future providing certain things like treated water to affected communities, affected regions, so that some of these interventions can also help address these problems. My last comment is that I've been interested in water for a, lot, a while now, and I, I looked at countries. Oh, so for instance, I'll use Australia as an example, if I call, compare Australia to Africa, it would not be a fair comparison because Australia is far advanced as compared to Ghana. But I realized that in typhoid fevers, for instance, if a person, one person gets typhoid fever in Australia, the whole health system is going to wake up. But I went to my, my regional health directory to get data on typhoid fevers and the numbers run into thousands, but much is not being, about, being done about it. But the difference also is that Everybody has access to treated water in Australia. Meanwhile, in the northern part of the country, for instance, nobody has, a lot of the people do not have access to treated water. But Thank you, Ebenezer. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to stop you there. I mean, just incredible points. And you kind of almost summarized the whole, um, the whole study in, in your, in your comments. Um, and, and they're just excellent points on, on some of these gaps. So I'm going to pass briefly to welcome. Um, and then we've just got five minutes left, unfortunately. Okay. okay. I'll just pass to welcome. Thank you. No, I, I think this raises a really critical point. So thank you very much, Ebenezer. So because, you know, welcome is just one organization. And we do have our mission uh, as a charitable foundation is focused on um, research. That is, that's our unique role. And so I'll give cholera an example. You know, we, we've, we've taken in over the last few years looking at vaccine effectiveness, but we would never ever think that, you know, the, our focus on vaccines should never be interpreted as that's we think is the most important area that we need to, that the world needs to, to focus on. We have to work like we do with cholera, working with the Global Task Force for Color Control and other stakeholders who will be able to fund other components such as infrastructure within countries, such as uh, wash studies and other types of work that are related to, to water. You know, so we have to know where what our remit is, but we have to know, knowing that you cannot address a problem with one single solution, we have to find the collaborations and the partnerships to be able to do that. So that's, we take, I take that on board, um, but it just means that that's how we will approach it. We will always try and work as a, a collective community with other funders, other governments, other agencies to really look at the problem as a whole. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there because I know we're running out of time, but thank you very much for the question. Brilliant. Well, that was a really fantastic set of questions. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to go through all of them. Um, but it was, um, I, th I think we covered as much uh, variety as we could. So I am now going to pass uh, to um, to Christine to, uh, Thank you. to do the, the most exciting bit of the day. This is the most exciting bit of the day. Thank you, Trudy. And hello to you all. My name is Christine from the Google Health Network Africa. And as Trudy said, I have the honor of presenting the most exciting part of this presentation today, which is how you can have access to this rich data, data set that we have um, continually spoken about on this call, as well as what opportunities for further research are available. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so firstly, we hope that you have found this interest uh, findings interesting. Um, today is a milestone because we are releasing the final report as well as making the data accessible to you. So on your screen, there is a QR code, which when scanned will provide you with full access to the data set. So we'll leave the screen right here as I finish up um, and give you an opportunity to do that. Um, this is a very vast data set and the analysis that we have uh, reported to you today is just an overall analysis of the whole global data set. And so there are many more questions um, that could be asked and should be asked of the data set. And we hope that you are able to make use of it. And we encourage groups and teams all across the globe um, to ask their own questions of this data. Um, and this could come from either a country or a regional perspective, including investigating any specific disease areas or tailoring research to um, diverse types of inquiries. Moreover, the comprehensive data on barriers and enablers that we've spoken about again on this presentation can also be harnessed to support initiatives that are aimed at um, 
strengthening research systems and fostering uh, capacity development programs. And again, this knowledge can further support um, addressing inequities in the research la landscape. As the Global Health Network, we stand ready to facilitate access to the data, and we look forward to all the amazing work that will come out of this data set from you and your teams. So thank you all, and I hand it back to Josie. Thank you, that's fantastic. So I do encourage everybody to, to look at the report as a high level analysis of, of what's been really shared with us. And I want to again, thank everybody for, for their input into the whole of the study. Thank you for those who've joined today's webinar and thank you to the expert committee to really help guide us through some you know difficult questions uh, that we need to really think about uh, with the data. And then finally to the Global Health Network for supporting this uh, great piece of work. Um, and I'm going to end now because I know we're at one minute too, but everybody have a great day and, um, and hope you, you know, continue engaging with Welcome Trust. Thank you.